Thank you very much for the opportunity to present and um, thank you much so much for being a very good collaborator and uh, it, yeah, it's uh, really a pleasure to work with you and um, thank uh, the you. data you're generating is such high quality and it's such uh, very relevant content as well. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is a form of machine learning called an artificial neural network and how we can use those for discovery in a, a, an omics setting. Um, it was Albert Einstein who said no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And in some ways in medicine, we are creating problems by generating understanding that maybe we can't always solve. So what we're trying to do maybe is create an all form, alternative form of intelligence that can help us solve those problems. So this perhaps is not the sort of artificial intelligence that we want. Um, this is how the media sometimes portrays artificial intelligence, and this is probably closer to true artificial intelligence. But at the end of the day, we want a, a, an artificial intelligence where we have control over it. And we want a power switch where we can switch it off when it doesn't do what we want it to do. Now, the human brain is, or human mind, is very good at finding pattern things, patterns in things. This is a, a way of us understanding the world around us. And it's also a survival mechanism. So if we see the stripes of a tiger, we learn quite quickly that. Uh, that's not a good thing, so we get out of the way. Um, maybe we didn't get the opportunity to learn that at first sometimes, but maybe we observed somebody who did. Um, computers, conversely, are very good at searching for features in very large, complex data spaces. Um, where perhaps traditional methods might fall down. But what we're doing essentially is creating a computer system that finds patterns, that finds information, and maybe doesn't get bored or but doesn't get distracted like the human mind can do. So the human mind or human brain has around about um, 10 to the 12 connections. Our neural networks have 10 to 1000 connections. We're getting the deep learning is adding more and more connections here. We use around 30 watts of power the human and the computer chip on its own right uses about 30 watts of power. We have a processing speed in the brain of 100 hertz, whereas a computer has a processing speed of you know, many gigahertz. The human brain has multi-directional connections and um, so it, it can infer things through those connections. And in the main, computers, though, tend to be an input versus relating to an output. But as you'll see in a while, we're, we're trying to develop some approaches which utilize those multi-directional connections in networks. Now, the human brain is very error tolerant. I've never seen anybody crash or uh, no, nobody has ever had a blue screen event it does computers can suffer errors and they don't deal well with errors they they have to shut down and restart the human brain doesn't need to do that and the human brain has many learning modes so it can memorize things it can infer things it can extrapolate it can interpolate whereas really with a computer brain it's memorization and based upon error and kind of a single learning mode Now, <clears throat> when we're working with omics data, and this is where we, our, our focus has been applying machine learning to inter interrogate omics data, then we have a number of challenges, and biological data is very different from other data sources. So, for example, in by, if we use RNA or DNA, then it cannot be, well, and proteins as well. The, the material mustn't be degraded. 
if it's been hanging around for a long time or if it's um, not treated in a proper fashion, then it can degrade very quickly. And that adds noise and randomness and makes it very difficult to find patterns in it. The way we measure every element, and it can be an expression measure, it can be a quantitation, must have equal reproducibility for every element. In other words, if we're very good at me measuring some parts of the data and very bad at measuring other parts, then the things that we're good at measuring become very good at predicting and the other things just get left behind and lose in we lose information that way. The other challenge is that if we put rubbish in to our model, we get rubbish out. You know, it, we will not get sensible results if we don't put good quality data in. And an another challenge is we need a good representative data set because all of these individuals are varying. We need enough samples to allow for a good quality, good robust um, analysis and being able to validate on unseen cases. <clears throat> Another challenge is the cursor's dimensionality. So this was a term that's been around some time, but essentially it's characteristics of, uh, of highly complicated systems. And what happens is that we effectively lose information in the sheer depth of data that we have. It's uh, you know try, trying to pick out a single star in a galaxy. And what happens is the dimensionality of the data masks what's important, makes it us hard to find the key features because of the, we're trying to look simultaneously at 50,000. And it makes us effectively trying to, we're trying to find a straw colored needle in a haystack or even a field of haystacks. Another challenge is computational time. So if we want to develop a classifier, a panel of markers that predicts cancer versus not cancer, for example, and we develop that from a typical array which might have 60,000 dimensions on it. And say we want to identify a panel comprising 10 genes or 10 markers. What we also want to do is use a, a random sample cross validation. So we want to keep testing on seen and unseen data. And to do all of that and to assess all combinations on that 60,000 dimensional array, we would need to run three times 10 to the 47 models. So you can see if we want a very robust and very um, thorough learning, we have to do a lot of computation. And when I started out my work as doing my PhD, a typical model would um, take around about a week to run. Then I started getting into omics data and a typical model then would take around six months to run. Now we've got that cut down to around five to six hours on average. <clears throat> Another challenge is the generality of models. So what we want is a model that will serve the general populace. So for example, if it's a panel of diagnosing a particular type or subtype of cancer, then we need to that to work for new cases. It needs to work for the population. There's no point us just being able to predict for a set of people in a very small population. So what we want to do is be applicable broadly to a broad population and not be constrained by a large set of conditions. And unfortunately, sometimes <clears throat> there's a tendency in scientists to gain understanding. They control something to such an extent that it ceases to be meaningful. So, for example, um, if we were to look at, uh, and this is a PhD student who, who was working for me, uh, who's now working at Stanford, uh, Gopal Gondole. Um, if we looked at estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, which is what he did, positive versus negative, uh, that's quite good. That looks at the general population. 
but you know there were people in that space who were working on very specific sets so estrogen receptor positive breast cancer who were age matched at 55 to 58 who had her two negative grade three stage two tumors who had overexpression of key 67 BRCA and VEGF you know that that's very very narrow and the, in that space you would get probably two cases or three cases per year in the UK that only serves those people often the number of genes identified will exceed the number of cases as well and this is also a problem because every individual could have their own gene in the classifier and you would still be able to predict 100 percent but if you add somebody else into the population it won't work for them <clears throat> the other challenge <coughs> excuse me the other challenge is biology is not linear. Genes are switched on or off. They have a step function. And the interaction between things means that you get extra complexities. So, for example, in the graph here, you can see the relationship between nuclear index for a particular set of molecules and the protein concentration. And you can see there are no straight lines in any of that. There are Gaussian curves, step curves, biphasic curves. And you know, linear biology, a simple linear regression of protein versus a nuclear index or expression of a, a protein or a, 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 a transcript will not easily lead to answer a clinical question. So we, we can't cope with nonlinearity if we use a conventional, simple statistical model. Now, I've, I've worked using machine learning for a number of years, and one of the common criticisms of data mining and analysis of such data is that a different set of people using a different set of algorithms or um, the same people using a different data set don't get the same answers. They will get a different set of features for a different question or different data set. And what that's suggesting to people is that these approaches are not very good because science should be reproducible. Now, one problem or one possibility that it might be that an individual data set doesn't have sufficient power and therefore is not accurate and we're finding false discoveries but <coughs> we so what we're trying to do is find ways of, of addressing that and one of the things with omics data because of dimensionality because of the non-linearity so we have to be very careful that what we find the things we find are not false discoveries because in such a complex space it's very easy to find things that are not real. Now, <clears throat> the approaches we've been using are, are parsimonious artificial neural networks. They're not deep learning. They're very simple networks and they learn in the same way as the human mind learns. They, they're iterative based upon error. So the error makes them adapt to learn and get better. We can model complexity and nonlinearity, so we effectively stitching together multiple sigmoid functions, multiple S-shaped curves. We've shown that the method will show good generalization. In one instance, we've validated our findings on 15,000 cases. We know the method copes well with high dimensionality. We use extensive cross-validation to add power. They're quick because they're very simple and parsimonious. And we can identify biomarkers. What we can also do is cross compare data sets and cross compare questions to get very robust features. Increasing our statistical power and also minimizing false discovery. So this is kind of the paradigm we're looking at. We have a set of individuals who are um, have two have different characteristics. Maybe one group will respond to a drug, one group will respond to a different drug. 
or it might be trade and in Germa, which is the, the work that um, Professor Shrivastava referred to. But essentially what we're doing is taking that population and then we are profiling those individuals. And that can be through gene expression arrays, that can be through RNA-seq, it can be through um, proteomics, and essentially generating a, a fingerprint for each one of those individuals. What we then do is we use our machine learning to identify the best subset or the key parameters to make our model. So we will use it to identify and pick the best combination of features and the simplest best combination of features that allows us to segregate out into treatment A or treatment B or low grade versus high grade or cancer versus non-cancer. And what that allows us to do is firstly, it allows us to identify the, the features biologically. So that helps us take those forward for understanding. But also we could develop that into a model that could be used clinically. So we have a stratified population, a population where we can predict whether they should an individual should get one treatment or another, for example. <clears throat> so just to illustrate the nature of the problem and how the human mind is good at certain things and computer intelligence is good at others. So if we to play a simple game of spot the difference, we can um, see very easily and very quickly that there is one difference. So the spot on column one, row two, is red in the first one and yellow in the second one. <clears throat> the next step is to spot the difference in a more yeah. complex network. Excuse me, my dog's just joined, joined me, so you may hear some funny noises. Um, and you can start to see that there are multiple differences here. If we then start to work towards consistent differences, this is where we're looking for consistent differences between the left-hand column and the right-hand column. You can see our mind has to work a little bit more. We have to search a little bit harder and have to think a little bit more. And for me, it's quite early in the morning, so I find it particularly difficult to find consistent differences. So here you can see that those are the consistent differences. So these spots and these spots are different in both of these arrays in the, between the two columns. But we also now have inconsistent differences. So some of these are different in one set, one pair, but not in the other. So that's getting a little bit harder. Then we start to go to, you know, this is a tenth of a microarray, really. So we start to get a bit more difficult, and there are differences here but it's more challenging. And now this reflects kind of the real world situation. We now have about 50,000 probes on a typical Affymetrix array. That could be up to 200,000. And you can see also we have a much larger population. And this, we can have a population of up to 500 individuals or 1,000 individuals per column here. So that makes it very difficult to find patterns and spot differences that are consistent between those. So we have to be a bit more systematic, but if we do it by our take a lot of time, and, you know, I'm sure yeah, somebody might go a little bit crazy spending probably about a year and a half just looking at spots on a microarray to find the difference. So that's why we use a computer method to do it. So we use a neural network and a neural network is a simplified version of a biological neural network. And what it does is it has axons and dendrites or nodes and <coughs> uh, weights. And what it will do is transport form input values to output values. So it receives a signal from an input 
it reaches a threshold and then it fires producing an output in the same way as a human neuron. Now we can use these to classify so we can find pattern features that allow us to predict group A or group B and we might use a combination of features, it could be a combination of proteins that predict cancer versus non-cancer. We can use them for reducing noise because you know it, the patterns we find will be there despite the noise in the data and they, we can also use them to predict so if we, for example we can predict things like survival as a continuous value. The key thing is though they can learn. They can in response to error they can generalize by including unseen data and they can cope with nonlinear and complex data. So if we look at this study here, or this network here, this is a typical artificial neural network. It's a very shallow neural network. It's only using three hidden nodes. But essentially we have inputs which would be or green levels. Those are scaled. And then our inputs are fed in to the network. So they have a weight which leads to a hidden node. And that hidden node receives the information and then fires applying an activation function, which here is a logistic function. And then those values fire and are received by an output node. So what, what this does is this, this receives inputs and mathematically transforms them to an output. So for example, it could be receiving a panel of five genes or six genes or six proteins, mathematically converting those numbers to allow us to predict the probability of high or low grade in meningioma. So see this if you like as a way of transforming values from input to output, but you could also consider it as uh, a multivariate nonlinear regression. together multiple logistic regressions because each one of these nodes is a, like a logistic regression. But we are adding complexity and we have more power than those methods. So if we take a simplification of our approach, we have an input value. We could make a prediction, which is the output from our model. We look at what actually happened. In other words, the error will um, give us how good our model was at predicting. And then that error is fed through an algorithm back to the network to, and changing and changes the parameters. And this cycles round again and again and again. And we keep doing that until we get an acceptable model. So what happens is we train our model on training data. And if we look at the performance of that, that model drops and the error declines. But we also need to look at generalization. We need to look at the ability to predict for unseen cases. So if we test our model as we go along, you can see that the error drops on an unseen data, but then starts to go up. So what's happening here is that the model is memorizing the data rather than generalizing on the data. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we do is we effectively extract a randomized test set and we periodically present that data. We call it selection data to the model. And then as we go on through the training, the model is tested on this unseen data set and we, we stop the training when it is, the performance is as good as it can be on that and if the if the performance starts to get worse for a number of epochs then we stop but we've saved the model at this optimal point this point where the error is at its lowest for unseen data and this is an ap approach which is called in machine learning terms early stopping and that early stopping means that we in basically get a generalized model 
Now, we're using a very shallow approach here. You may have heard of deep learning. Um, it's very popular at the minute. It's very useful for image data and text data, but it's not very good, in my opinion, for omics data. And the reason for that is because, well, one, it's a, a very complex set of inputs, and two, it's very prone to false discovery. So, you know, it, effectively, if you give the hidden layer enough detection ability, you can predict from randomness. So if you're looking to find the best set of things, the best set of proteins or genes, then the problem with that is everything starts to look very good because you're giving a huge amount of predictive ability to the network. The other problem is that these deep networks take a huge amount of time to train. They're extremely complicated. And as we add layers, and you can see multiple layers here, and as a, we add complexity, so the time for training exponentially increases. <clears throat> so if we're looking at a very large, very complex data set, you, you could spend six months, a year running your model and then find, and that would be using high performance computing, and then find actually you'd not really discovered anything relevant. And that's a problem. So <clears throat> Our approach uses this constrained architecture because we make the network work harder. And by doing that, we make we get better separability between the best things to predict the, quest, the answer to our question and the worst things. So <clears throat> by way of an example, we used multiple microarray cohorts for a breast cancer study. And with this, we were looking at proliferation. And to overcome the risk of false discovery, what we did was run these data sets in parallel. And we then predicted for multiple questions. <coughs> From that, we looked at the rank order of, of probes. And we looked for commonality between those in the high rank probes. So effectively, the other way to look at this is we ran a model we took a data set, ran multiple models using our ANN, and then we looked for commonalities in the top 100 or 200 features. And if we look at the performance of single features, we end up with this sharp hook here. This hook is um, an enriched set of things that relate to the answer. Now, biology is very complicated, and it's very unlikely that you'll ever get a single molecule that explains the whole process. But you often end up with an enriched set of features that are related to the process. Now, this allows us to rank performance based on a single question on a single data set. But if we repeat that using multiple randomizations and multiple data sets, then by comparing the membership of this list, we end up finding a lot more robust things. So in our analysis for the proliferation study, and this was conducted by Devika Agarwal, um, who is now currently working in Oxford University, we were able to identify a set of common genes overlapping between multiple questions and multiple data sets. So what we find in the top 100, we found 34 common genes across five questions, across three cohorts of data from those rank orders. If we look at the top 200, it goes to 68. If it goes up, if we look at the top 500, it starts to converge at around about 72 to 76. Now, we ask ourselves, what is the chance of this happening randomly? So what's the probability of finding these common genes in the top 100 of a minimum of five questions in three say, data sets by chance? So the chances we worked out of finding a single gene are calculated like this. So we look at 100 genes in our first data set, which has 47,000 probes. And that gives us the probability in one question. 
So if we take that to the power of five, it gives us the probability in five questions. But then also we have an extra data sets. So we have a second question, sorry, a second data set which has 22,000 probes, and we have our third data set which has 48,000 probes. So the chances of finding something, a single gene in common in the top 100 of those three data sets across five questions, 10 to the minus 39. But remember, we found 34. So, um, well, I tried to calculate the p-value in uh, a 64-bit version of Excel, and it still came up with zero. It couldn't work it out. The point is, is the things we find by this method are extremely statistically robust. Now, on the basis of that, we published this data and we published our <coughs> answer in Lancet Oncology, and we found that SPAG5 has a um, particularly um, robust, you know, it was the key feature here, and we, we validated that in a large number of cases. And it predicts uh, proliferation, but also predicts chemotherapy sensitivity. And here we used an integrated genomic, transcriptomic and proteomic approach. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So, biology is not just a list of genes, though. What we want to also understand is how things interact with one another. And in biology, we are, you know, it's a network of things. Things co-regulate one another in a pathway or they, they influence each other in a positive or negative way. And you know, pathways kind of are a way of effectively regulating the system and it becomes a bit of a dance of the molecules. But we don't really fully understand those pathways. So what we want to try and do is infer those pathways using our approaches, um, using a machine learning approach. So what we're using here is effectively a, a, a form of systems biology. And the, the term for what we're doing is a network inference. So what we use is a machine learning algorithm, an ANN algorithm, to predict the relationship between markers in a defined subset. And what happens is multiple markers are used to predict the expression of a single marker. And then we change that single marker so and repeat the process. And what this does is effectively gives us a network or a matrix of interactions in a list of genes. And from this, we can identify key molecular drivers, things that are highly influential in a system. So to visualize that, effectively, we have, let's say we have 16 markers. We have a new, we run that a new neural network so that 15 markers are predicting one. What we then do is we, we train that neural network model using the procedures, early stopping, and parsimony and um, repeating cross-validation and concordance analysis to find across all of that the weights or the interactions between the, the source genes and the target gene. So for example here where there's no line that's a very weak interaction. So for example, this node here to this node has little or no interaction. Whereas something like this one here has a very strong interaction from this source to the yellow target. So the next step of the process is we, we turn the dial around and now this yellow dot becomes the target. And we have a set of weights of things that influence that. And what's important to note here is that if we look at these two yellow dots, this yeah, in the first step, this yellow dot was predicted by this one in a multifactorial model. 
And in the second step, this yellow dot was predicted by this one in the multifactorial model. So in our matrix of interactions, we have an edge or we have values going in both directions between any pair of nodes. So if we repeat this again for the third target, the fourth target, the fifth target, and so on, we end up with an overall matrix of, of interactions in a multifactorial model for our network. Now, we can put a sign on those, so if they're inhibitory or stimulatory. <coughs> and um, in colder countries, interestingly, red is a positive colour and blue is a negative colour. In warmer countries, blue is a positive colour and red is a negative colour. And that's an interesting observation, uh, having worked with various people and caused some confusion at the start. The, so we can look at the, the colour, which represents the strength of uh, the nature of the interaction, and we can look at the thickness of the line, which represents the weight of the interaction. We can also put on here directionality. So something like this arrow here, the, the strength of the influence going that way was very strong, but the reciprocal influence coming back was very weak. So it becomes a unidirectional influence. There's this one. The strength of influence going in both directions was about the same. And so it's a, a feedback loop or a mechanism. And then from this, we can also potentially find, for example, things which are stimulatory in one direction and inhibitory in the other, or positive influences reciprocating ne negative influences. <coughs> so what does that look like in reality? Well, this is um, 100 targets, 100 genes, and we've filtered it a little bit. So this is taking out the top 5% of interactions or keeping the top 5% of interactions. And you can see we end up with a very complex network and it's very difficult to interpret. So we have to filter it more to visualize it at least. And so this is a, a typical network that we end up with. This is a, a model of the P53 pathway using our methods. And you can see now we start to get certain features coming up. We start to get hubs, things which are strongly influenced or strongly influential. You can see here we've got some of our reciprocal feedback mechanisms going on. We have some hubs down here as well. But also we, we start to get things like tightly regulated motifs, kind of semi diffuse networks where there's no particular hub but there's a lot of strong regulatory interaction going on in that region. So all of this tells us something about the biology of the, uh, the state and the question we're looking at. But this is not looking at known pathways from the literature. This is purely using the method of network inference on the data that we've generated. Now, because we've filtered here, this is a limitation. This is literally the tip of the iceberg. It's you know, this is about the top 0.1% to 0.5% of the network. So it doesn't tell us an awful lot. And if we went any deeper, we'd not be able to see patterns. So what we do is we mathematically slice into that network and work out the sum of the values leading to and from each gene. So obviously we've got values leading to this and that's quite high. But we also have values leading from it, but those have not come out in our filtering so readily. Maybe there's a couple here. But if we take the sums of the values leading to and from each gene, then we can rank them. So if we look at our P53 analysis, then um, actually please ignore the gene symbol because for some reason they're not linking up to and gene titles. But if we look here, um, the things in in white are the existing members of the P53 pathway. Things in green are new members that we've identified. But you can see here one of our top regulators of the P53 pathway is P53, which is encouraging. 
But we also find things like heat shock protein 70 and um, we find topo, topo 2. So there's, a, you know, it tells us a lot more than the original pathway uh, would have told us. Um, interestingly, we have MDM2, which is new, and other people have shown that, although it doesn't exist in the primary pathway, other people have shown that it's important. But we can also do the analysis in the other direction. So, for example, we can find the most influenced features. So this identifies the most influential, the drivers of the pathway, if you like. And this one identifies the most influenced, the receivers or the driven elements of the pathway. And so we can um, see the features coming up and you can see here this um, apoptosis inducing protein related to P53 is one of the most influenced features, one of the strongest receivers. So it allows us to look in both directions and get a rank order of, of features. And this tells us an awful lot more about what's going on in that system. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm, I'm going to stop with the, the lecture element, but there's a lot of people I need to thank. Um, the members of the Van Geest Cancer Research Centre, um, Demetrius Kapsoulis, who was a former PhD student of mine, David Bucock, who's our mass spectrometrist, who generates uh, proteomic data for me to work on, um, Dalia Mahasi, who's current, a current PhD student. This work is commercialised as well through a company called Intelligent Omics, and Dr Simon Howarth is the CEO of that company, I'm the CSO. We also have um, from Nottingham University's Hospital Trust, Dr. Tarek Abdul Fattah, who is a pathologist, and then a number of pathologists and oncologists from the University of Nottingham, who, although they're just down the road from us, we collaborate very closely with. And we've just had some funding from Innovate UK to, to take some of these methods forward and validate them further. So, a number of my PhD students say that I've built my academic career using an artificial brain, and um, there is some evidence that that is the case. <clears throat>